Welcome back. Today we talk more about parametric equations as well as implicit definitions. Notice that project eight was collected last class. Required form is due this class. Quiz number nine has just happened. So uh, take a look at that first column to figure out exactly what dates uh, these things are supposed to be turned in by. Uh, also notice this is the last day of new material before our review day next class. And then test number three, and right in there, you should be able to see exactly what your test window is. Test three is on all the stuff since test two, um, but of course it might rely on some of the stuff that comes before test two. Number one, today we continue talking about parametric equations. We start by trying to parameterize a given path. For example, what if we want a path that starts at zero one on the unit circle and moves around it counterclockwise? Okay, so the basic idea with parameterizing a curve is to start with x equals and y equals, and we're gonna put in things with t in both of those blanks. And if we want uh, a circle, then it's gonna be sine and cosine in some order. So I'm just gonna write this. Uh, you don't need to write this just yet because it could be that, or it could be that we let x equal cosine and y equal sine. And I know that for much of this semester, we've, we've said x is equal to cosine of theta and y is equal to sine of theta. And that's true in terms of um, uh, the definitions of sine and cosine as functions. But uh, here we're just trying to come up with any old way to, to get a curve that's going to trace out this given path. And it's supposed to start at the point zero one and go uh, counterclockwise. That's the goal. So we're not restricted to like automatically x is always cosine and y is always sine. Okay, so the first thing I'm gonna do is plug in t equals zero to figure out where um, each of these two parameterizations starts. So if we plug in t equals zero into the first one, we go sine of zero is zero and cosine of zero is one. So x and y are zero and one respectively. So that seems pretty good because that's gonna start the curve right up there at the top. Whereas if we had plugged zero in for these t's, x is cosine of zero, so that would be one, and then y is sine of zero, so that would be zero. So that's not right because that would start at the point there. Okay, so that tells me which one I should pick. We're gonna pick the first one. But uh, there's this extra thing that says that we're supposed to go counterclockwise and, and we may or may not go counterclockwise according to what we've written so far. So the next thing to do after we've decided which one is going to give us the right starting point is to then plug in t equals pi over 2. And t equals pi over 2 is either going to land me here, which is what I'm hoping, or here. And if it's the second case, we'll have to fix it. So we'll plug in t equals pi over 2 to find out what the next important point is on this curve. Okay, so plugging into the first equations right here, we're doing sine of pi over 2 and cosine of pi over 2. Sine of pi over 2 is up at the top, that's 1. Cosine of pi over 2 is 0. So the point 1, 0 is right here, which means that in fact we're actually tracing the curve, the circle, clockwise, which is not what I want. What I really wanted was to land on the point over here, which is at negative one comma zero. So, okay, it didn't work. I'd really like that to be negative one. Well, how can I make it negative one? Well, I could, I could put a negative right there. So our answer is gonna be, um, well, we'll just highlight it over here, is x is negative sine of t and y is cosine of t. I'd encourage you to pause the video and punch those things into your calculator after you change to parametric mode and confirm that it uh, traces out the unit circle starting at the top and going counterclockwise. So, okay, so hopefully you've done that. And uh, I'll just say this is one of many possible answers. There are infinitely many right answers to this problem. Um, so don't feel like it has to be this one, but I'm giving you a process that I think will work for you. Uh, first, verify your starting point and, uh, by plugging zero in and then plug in pi over two to verify that it's going clockwise or counterclockwise. Okay, uh, second part here, how about a path that starts at one zero as opposed to zero one, and this one we want to go clockwise. Okay, so we want it to go one zero. So let's try this guy, x equals y equals. All right, well, we're gonna use some, some advanced knowledge we have here because we saw that this guy actually started at the point one zero. 
So why don't we just use that as our beginning one? Cosine of t, sine of t. And then we'll plug in, we've already got the starting point right, so next thing we'll do is plug in pi over 2. Cosine of pi over 2 is uh, what? 0, comma, sine of pi over 2 is 1. Let's see if that's what we wanted. So we wanted to start at the point 1, 0 here, and we wanted to go clockwise. Uh, we did start at the point 1, 0. The second point is 0, 1, which is up here, which means, again, unfortunately, we're going the wrong way. We wanted to land down here at the point 0, negative 1. So how do I make it 0, negative 1? I just put a negative right there in front of the y. So cosine t, negative sine t. That's one possible parameterization. There are many others. Two, we now discuss projectile motion. Suppose a ball is launched with an initial velocity of v0 feet per second at an angle of theta with the horizontal from an initial height of y0 feet. All right, this looks like a run-on sentence to me, but that's okay. So uh, we've got this ball. It's going to start up here at a height of y0. That's up to the top. And, uh, and then we're going to launch it at an angle of theta there. But of course, as soon as we launch it at that angle theta, gravity is immediately going to take hold of it and bring it crashing right back down to Earth. But the initial angle is theta. And in fact, in calculus, you'll talk about that line being tangent to that curve. Um, so uh, the question is, you know, like, where is this ball at any moment in time? Well, it turns out that the parametric equations for the position of the object, the ball, uh, after t seconds are given by this stuff right here. So uh, the x-coordinate is always v0, that was the initial velocity, times cosine of theta, that's this theta, times t. And the y is far more complicated. Minus 16t squared, where in the heck does that number come from? Plus v0 sine theta times t. That part at least seems reasonable to me. If I like this, then I should like that because they're the same, but x has cosine and y has sine, and then plus y0, that's the initial height. Okay, um, we're not going to talk about why these equations are true. You can see me outside of class if you're interested in knowing a little bit more about why these equations are true, but they will be derived in your physics class. Uh, let's have a link. Uh, look at this link to convince ourselves that gravity does not affect horizontal velocity. Um, so let's uh, pull this up. So where are we here? This one. So um, you can uh, skip ahead to about a minute into this video. And um, uh, in fact, you're going to need to do that. Uh, you're going to need to watch the video on your own because I don't want to embed this video in my video for copyright reasons. But I'll just explain what's going on. Um, there are these two uh, billiard balls, pool balls, and uh, the one on the left is going to drop straight down, and the one on the right is going to get uh, ejected to the right, and it's also going to fall down. Uh, but they're both going to fall at the same exact moment. And so the left ball goes straight down, but the one on the right goes down and to the right. And the point here is that gravity cares not at all about horizontal velocity which means that the ball on the left and the ball on the right, even though one is going straight down and one is going down and to the right, they're both going to hit the ground at exactly the same moment. And in fact, they're both going to hit the ground the second time at exactly the same moment. So, um, so go ahead and pause my video here and watch this video on your own and then come back. Okay, so hopefully that demonstration convinces you that uh, the uh, gravity does not at all have any effect um, on the horizontal velocity. It's just the straight up and down, the vertical component of velocity that gravity is affecting, which is why um, gravity has this, uh, sorry, the y component, the y component of this position um, has this more complicated negative 16t squared. That thing right there is the, gravity piece, and it doesn't appear in the x component. All right, so we're going to use those equations that we haven't derived to do number three. A golf ball is hit from the ground with an initial speed of 150 feet per second at an angle of 30 degrees. Find the parametric equations that give its position as a function of time. 
how far away from its initial position will it be when it hits the ground? Okay, so let's draw a quick picture. So at an angle of 30 degrees, so we'll ballpark 30 degrees, maybe there. And then we've got this golf ball hit from the ground. And so initially it's going up following that path, but gravity grabs it immediately and brings it back down, hopefully near the cup. And um, we want to write down the equations for uh, where this ball is at any moment in time. And so what we had was x equals and y equals. Okay, so the equations up above, it said v0, that's the initial velocity, that's 150, times cosine of the angle, 30 degrees, times t. And the y was more complicated. It was minus 16t squared, that's just in there every time, plus v0, still 150, but now it's sine, because it's the y component. The angle is still 30. There's still a t here at the end, so again, this piece is supposed to look an awful lot like that piece. But then there's a plus y0, the initial height. How far off the ground is this ball when we hit it initially? Well, it's zero feet off the ground because it says it's hit uh, from the ground. That's the y0 is zero part. Okay, so these are our equations, but let's clean them up a little bit. x equals, <clears throat> okay, 150 cosine of 30 degrees. So cosine of 30 is what, root 3 over 2? And that's times t. And so 150 and 2 cancel, so we get 75 root 3 times t. And y is equal to minus 16 t squared. Uh, 150 sine of 30 is a half. That's times t. I won't write the plus 0. So we get minus 16 t squared plus 75 t. And... Um, Okay, so that's fine. So those are our two equations. And then let's answer the follow-up question here. How far from its initial position will it be when it hits the ground? So that wants to know how far it is here to here. Okay, so in order to figure out how far it is, what I need to do is plug in the value of t that represents hitting the ground. So I'm just going to uh, plug in however many seconds it takes for this ball to hit the ground, put it right there. And that will give me my x position, which will be my, my distance. But it doesn't say in this problem how long it takes for the ball to hit the ground. So we've got to figure that out. So let's write that as our next step here. So how do we do that? Well, what's special about that point? It's on the ground. We're trying to find the x. But if you're on the ground, then you know what the y is. How much is the y when the ball is hitting the ground? The y is zero. So we're going to set a setting y equal to zero. So let's set the y value equal to zero. So this equation comes down here. And we go zero equals negative 16 t squared plus. 75t. And let's go ahead and factor t out of uh, the right hand side. And then split it up so either t is 0 or negative 16t plus 75 is 0. And solve this equation and we should get 75 sixteenths of a second. So, you know, like four and a half seconds or so. And now that we know the value of t when this ball is on the ground, we can come back and answer the question, which was about finding this horizontal distance. Well, we're going to plug t equals 75 sixteenths seconds into our x equation. OK, so let's plug into our x equation x equals, so what did we have? Was it 75 root 3 times t? Yeah. 75 root 3 times the amount of time, in this case it's 75 sixteenths of a second. Let's finally use the calculator here to help us.
So about 609 feet. And so that's about 200 yards, which is reasonable. Uh, many golfers can hit the ball 200 yards. I can't. Um, and that's it. So uh, why don't we just do one last thing here. We're done with this problem, but I just want to do one other part. I'm going to graph this thing on the calculator and see if it looks like this picture here with the ball going up and then coming down. Okay, so we'll change our mode to parametric, go into y equals, type in our two equations, 75 root 3 times t. And then the other one was the minus 16t squared plus 75t. Okay, a window. Uh, let's see. This is the time. Well, we figured out how long this ball's in flight. It was 75 sixteenths seconds, um, which is a little less than five seconds. So why don't we just go zero to five? Because after that, it's it's already underground. Point one is probably fine there. Okay, uh, let's start this at zero because the ball starts at the origin. And what we just discovered is that it gets about 610 feet away to get out to here. So let's go out to like, I don't know, 620 and go by 50s. Okay, uh, zero here. Uh, how high does the ball get up there at the top? Well, we didn't calculate that. We could get a quickie estimate if we wanted to. Um, we know it took about, about five seconds for the ball to get to the end. So that means it's right here in the middle at the top, about two and a half seconds in. So if you just plug two and a half in for both of these T values right here, then you'll have um, an estimate for how high this ball gets at the top. Um, I don't feel like doing that, so I'm just gonna plug a number in and if it's no good, we'll fix it. So how high might the ball get? I don't know, 100 feet. And let's just see what happens. Hey, that was pretty good. Um, Okay, so there's the path of the ball going up and then coming down and then hitting the ground. Now, I know that um, in past math classes, you've drawn plenty of parabolas and you've been given problems where the ball goes up and then comes down and it's not a big deal. And why do we need something so complicated when you've done easy parabola stuff before? Well, the easy parabola stuff before um, involved a ball going straight up and coming straight back down. It didn't have a ball going out and up and down. It was just straight up and straight down. And you can go back and check your notes and your books and all that stuff to notice this one detail that every parabola problem that you did about a ball, the ball went straight up and came straight back down. But here we've added a whole other dimension of motion. We've added a horizontal piece to the motion. And so um, when we're looking at this graph, this is actually the path of the ball which is different from when you're drawing your parabolas because when you're drawing your, your straight, your ball going straight up and down parabola, the horizontal axis here is time and time is passing and the ball is going straight up and coming straight back down. So even though it looked like your parabola was the path of the ball, it wasn't. It was just us trying to uh, stretch out this motion of going straight up and straight down along the time axis. So yes, it's more complicated, but it's a far more complicated um, scenario that you're able to tackle right now with parametric equations. Next page, number four, there's a famous curve called the cycloid, which is the path traced out by a point on a wheel as the wheel rolls. Does this sound familiar? I hope it does. Well, let's have a look at this GSP file. You can play around with this on your own. It's on Moodle. Here it is. So this ball is gonna move, uh, it's gonna spin around clockwise and roll along this straight line. And we're gonna trace the that Point right there, that dot. And so this curve right here is called a cycloid, and it is the same curve that you guys worked with in that project about the bicycle wheel. So we'll stop it there. Um, it's not parabola, parabola, parabola. It's not part of a circle, circle, circle. It's not part of an ellipse. It's just a whole brand new curve that has its own equation uh, that's different than the equation you've seen before. Um, so let's uh, do number five here. Let's derive the equations for a cycloid created by a circle of radius one with center starting at uh, zero one. 
and tracing the point starting at 1, 1. First, we need to draw a picture. So let's see here. So it says we've got the unit circle, and circle of radius 1, and the center starts at 0, 1. And the circle of radius 1 means it, the bottom of the circle hits the origin right there. OK, fine. And then we're going to trace the point that's starting at 1, 1, which is this guy at the extreme right. So this is exactly the setup that you guys tackled in that project about the bicycle wheel. Uh, in this problem, it doesn't say whether the wheel is going clockwise or counterclockwise. Um, I'm going to have it go clockwise, which is the same way that it went in the project. OK, and so what we want to do is figure out um, what's happening to that point. Well, let's see. Uh, the, the, um, the point will move from where it currently is, the starting point, to here after the wheel rotates just a little bit. But as the wheel rotates a little bit, the bike moves horizontally this way. And so that point right there is actually going to end up um, out here. And then the next point may be here. Uh, the wheel has rotated more, so the bike has moved more. Uh, sorry. Oops. Um, I think I need to put this. OK, bad things are happening. Let's try one more time here. One there. OK, um, so the, the first point is out here somewhere and then the next point is out here somewhere and then at some point uh, the point of the wheel would be at the bottom but it's actually the whole bike has moved forward that way so the question is what does it look like um, you know is it like straight lines is it curving this way and then up is it curving this way and then up so lots of different choices here well let's go ahead and find the equations well in fact you guys found the equations already so Let's use the work that you did on that project. OK, let's start with the y. So we know that um, uh, the y value is going to be the sine value. So let's start with sine of theta. A little detail here. Uh, the wheel was going clockwise. So that means that theta is actually uh, in the opposite direction from what we call positive angles. And then finally, we need to take that sine value and bump it up a full unit because the center of the wheel is one unit off the ground. So theta, so we were imagining axes like that, and then theta would just be this angle in here. Okay, the x was a little more complicated. Uh, all right, so it's x, it's going to be cosine. And again, it's negative theta because we're going clockwise. Uh, here you don't need to um, you don't need to bump anything because if you just plug zero in for theta, assuming the wheel hasn't moved at all, like zero is your angle, uh, cosine of zero is one, and one is exactly where this wheel starts in terms of the x component. But what we do need to take into account is the horizontal movement of the bike, and so um, the bike is going to move horizontally by however much, uh, so like if we're just looking at this angle right here, the bike is going to move by whatever the arc length is right there. And um, you guys know that the arc length is given by theta times r, but the radius in this case is 1. So the arc length is just theta. And so the bike is going to move horizontally by theta. Um, and so you guys had a plus theta there in your project. You also had a minus 1 in your project uh, at the end of this x equation. And that was because I, I just added in this little twist that said, um, don't just write where the x is, but actually give me the horizontal distance that the this blemish on the wheel is uh, from its original starting point. So you had to do like this minus 1 to correct for the fact that it naturally started out here at 1, and I wanted a distance from the start. But here we want distance from the y-axis, just normal x distance. OK, so let's type in these things and see how it looks. So uh, cosine of negative, all right, we don't have theta, we have t, plus theta, t, that's good. And then down here, sine of negative t plus 1. OK, the window for the golf ball is not appropriate anymore, so let's fix this. 
Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at like three complete cycles of this thing. So how about we go up to six pi, right? Every two pi is one revolution. Uh, going by point twos is probably fine. Okay, um, so where will this guy start? Well, uh, I guess zero is fine here. Uh, how far will it end up horizontally? Well, take a look. It says cosine of minus theta plus theta. So theta is getting out to about 18. So the bike is getting all the way out there to about 18. So let's go up to 20. Okay, uh, the y's are far easier because the bottom of the wheel is zero, top of the wheel is two, and we don't have to go any further than that. And uh, last thing, make sure you're in radian mode here because we typed in pi's. And let's hit graph. And now we see the path that that blemish on the wheel traces out. And you can see it started exactly where we expected, uh, right there at 1-1. Um, at one, one. And then it uh, made three complete revolutions. It looks like this one stopped early, but it's only because it kind of started like the this first part here would fit perfectly there if we wanted to uh, change the window a little bit. So that's the graph, and that looks an awful lot like this. This one is just, um, you know, like stretched differently or uh, vertically than compared to ours, but it's exactly the same. And so, yes, it's very complicated equations, and yes, it's very complicated behavior, but, but we nailed it. This is exactly the right setup in order to uh, figure out uh, exactly what a point on a wheel is doing as that point rolls, or as the wheel rolls. Okay, six. Here are two famous mathematical problems. First one is called the brachistochrone problem. You can see chrone there, so it has something to do with time. This is called the shortest time problem. Your goal is to find a curve so that a ball rolls from one point to another point in the shortest time. So for example, suppose that we wanted to get a ball from the start point to the end point, and we wanted to build some track to try to get that ball from the start to the end as quick as possible. So would you build the track like A, or would you build the track like B, or would you build the track like C? Again, the goal is to get the ball to roll on the track from the start to the end as quick as possible. Pause the video here and uh, pick which one you think is going to be the shortest time path. Okay, so hopefully um, you guys have come to some conclusion. There's a link here that you're going to want to go to. I will set it up here, but I'm not going to hit play again for copyright reasons. But uh, these three paths are quite similar to the three that I've drawn here. So you've got the line in the middle. This blue one is um, is that, that one in the back, and then this guy down here. Um, so go ahead and hit the uh, play button there and watch the video and figure out who wins. Okay, so hopefully you saw in the video that uh, C was the winner by quite a large margin, um, and then uh, B was second, and A was very, very slow. I mean, A had a lot of velocity at the end, but it took forever to get going because it was so flat in the beginning. So um, so that curve right there was the winner, and the question is, well, how do you make sure that you get the, like, you, you know you want it to start off, um, you know, decreasing quickly, but, but how do you pick it so it's the, the perfect, the optimal curve? Do you want it to be part of a parabola? Do you want it to be part of a circle? There are a lot of things that look like this curve. Okay, we'll come back to that. Uh, I said there were two problems. The first one was the shortest time problem. Second one is the Tautochrone problem, also about time, but this one is about equal time. Find a curve so that a ball rolls from any point to the bottom point in the same amount of time. From any point to the bottom point in the same amount of time. Okay, so uh, for example, suppose that you put a ball right here on this curve and another ball right here on this curve, and you let both balls go at exactly the same time. Would the two different balls reach the end at exactly the same moment? No, of course not. This one that was much closer to the finish line would finish first, and the other one would finish second. So this is not the winning curve, because you put um, balls at two different spots, let them go, they don't automatically hit the end at exactly the same time. What if we look at this curve at the top? Suppose you put a ball right here in the flat part, and another ball right here, and let them go at exactly the same time. Is that a fair race? No way. This one is on the best part of the curve. It's going to zip to the finish line. This one will very slowly meander and eventually speed up and hit the end. So that's not the winning curve either. So the winning curve is in the next video. So go to the next video. Uh, I'll set it up. This young lady here is going to uh, let her hands go. You got this one 
track with the two different lanes and the car is starting at two different spots. This right here is the finish line. It says it right there. And so what you're going to do is watch the video and see what happens with these two cars as they approach the finish line. Okay, so hopefully we saw that the two cars ended up finishing at exactly the same time, which is quite strange given that this guy uh, had, well, this guy had such a head start, right? This car was, was so much closer to the finish line. So how did this car make up that time? Well, this car had a steeper beginning part. And so this one got more velocity initially compared to this one. And it worked out perfectly so that they both finished at exactly the same time. And that would be the case no matter where you put the two cars. You could put this guy all the way up here at the top. You could put this guy two inches from the, the finish line here. Let them go at the same time. This guy would come blaring out of the, the start gate. This one would very slowly creep along because it's almost flat down there. And they would both hit here at exactly the same time. Of course, the yellow car would continue on because it was going so much faster. All right, so here's the idea. Um, the curve that was the solution to this shortest time problem, this one down here, is an upside down cycloid. It's this curve flipped over. That's the winning curve. It's not a parabola. It's not part of a circle. It's an upside down cycloid. That's the optimal curve and that's been proven using calculus by some of the best minds um, of mathematics uh, back in the, uh, I think 17, 1800s, 1700s. Um, and, uh, down here, this equal time curve, the one for this one, is also an upside down cycloid. So the curve that makes these two cars um, get to the finish line at exactly the same time, no matter where you release them from, is the same curve. It's an upside down cycloid. Seven, let's put together our newfound knowledge of the solutions to the brachistic crone problem, that was the shortest time one, and the tauta crone problem, the equal time one. We'll pause this video at the start and predict what's going to happen. So here's the last video for today. We've got six different tracks here. You've got a straight line. You've got three things here that look exactly the same as each other. Those are the upside down cycloids. Then you've got this one, which is kind of like a, a cycloid, but not, not quite. Um, and this guy, which is very steep in the beginning and then very flat at the end. And so we're going to hit the play button, but don't hit the play button yet. So the first question is, uh, which ball is going to finish first? And the second question is, are any balls going to finish at the same time? So pause my video and uh, answer those questions before you watch this video. Okay, so hopefully we've thought about this and decided that the cycloid is going to finish first. So one of these three is going to be the winner because the cycloid is the shortest time curve. Well, which one is going to win? Well, the cycloid is also the equal time curve. So which one is going to win? Well, they're all going to win. It's going to be a tie for first place between these three things. So let's um, pause my video and then watch this video and see if our, uh, if our intuition is right. Okay, so hopefully we saw what we expected to see. And uh, the cycloid is a pretty powerful curve. Last thing, number eight, consider a unit circle centered at the origin. Let's write down three different kinds of equations for this circle. First is implicit, which means the x's and y's are all mixed together. So our standard equation of the curve from a long time ago, x squared plus y squared equals r squared. It's a unit circle, so the radius is one. Now we're going to talk about an explicit version of that. Explicit means that you're going to solve for y. So first subtract x squared. Take the square root of both sides. Don't forget when you take the square root, got to put in the plus or minus, otherwise you only have the top half of the circle. And then finally C, parametric, which means separate equations for x and y in terms of t. x equals y equals, okay, so this one could be anything. Uh, I'll put sine of t and cosine of t. In fact, I'll put negative cosine of t. Makes no difference what we do there. Um, it would change the starting point and change uh, whether it goes clockwise or counterclockwise, but any combination of sines and cosines, pluses and minuses is fine. Um, and that's it. So three different ways to think about the circle, implicit, explicit, and parametric.
All right, the group activity follows. Um, maybe before we look at the group activity, well, you're going to give it a real good shot before you look for my video, but uh, let's just play with this sketchpad thing a tiny bit more. Okay, so the first one, I'm going to hit play here. Well, I'll show this extra thing here. So um, instead of rolling a wheel on a, um, on a straight line, you might think about rolling a wheel inside of a curve, inside of a circle. And so you can trace the path of this dot right here as this inner wheel rolls around inside of the circle. And that curve that we get is going to be called an epicycloid as opposed to just a plain old cycloid. And if instead you let your wheel roll around the outside of the curve, so this wheel is going to spin around and we're going to trace the point as it bounces around the outside of the circle. That's called a hypocycloid. So we can just hit play. And we can watch these two different curves get traced out. And if you're a fan of toys from the 80s, this might look like something you've seen before. It's called a spirograph. I think you can still get them on eBay. Okay, that's kind of cool. We'll let them do their thing. Something different. What if a farmer's cart has square wheels, but as he drives it down his road, he gets a smooth ride? What does the road look like? So somehow, uh, you know, I mean, if it were just a flat road, then we know that the, the square wouldn't roll at all. It would just, you know, ka-chunk, 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 and it would be very abrupt. Every time we get around one of these corners, it would smash into the ground on one of the sides of the square. But somehow uh, there is a shape of road that's going to make it so we have a smooth ride. So, for example, um, uh, we need the road to make it so that this kind of motion is smooth. So here's the basic idea. I'm going to trace the, the wheel. And then along the bottom of this tracing, we see the curve that the farmer wants. And that curve is, in fact, again, the cycloid. So if a uh, farmer has square wheels, that seems like it would be a problem. But as long as that farmer carves out a cycloid-shaped uh, road leading to his farm, then he'll be able to uh, drive his square wheeled vehicle with no problems at all. Okay, so I've pulled up another sketchpad file here. Uh, I think I might have said that the previous sketchpad file was available on our Moodle site, and actually I don't think that's the case because I didn't make the other one, but this one should be available. So here's the idea. You've got a ladder right here, and it's uh, touching a wall here, and it's touching the ground down here. And the uh, ladder is just going to fall down. So this point is just going to slip to the right, and this uh, ladder is going to stay touching the wall, but it's just going to slide down the wall. And so first we'll let the ladder fall just so we get a sense of what's happening. Okay, that's fine. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a point on the ladder. And the question is, um, what kind of curve are we going to get if we just trace that point? So the ladder is going to ladder is going to be right here to start, and it's going to end right here. So I know the, the point is going to be here at the start and here at the end. But the question is, what kind of a curve does it trace out? Is it going to be like a straight line? Is it going to curve in this way? Is it going to curve that way? Maybe pause my video and see if you can think about what this guy's going to do. Okay, so hopefully you came up with some sense of what it's going to do. So it's a curve that looks like that. So is that a cycloid? I mean, like the answer to every question today has been cycloid. So maybe that's a cycloid. Well, let's um let's do something like this. Uh, I'm going to show you three other ladders. There they are, just symmetric all around the origin. And I think the trace is on on all of these. Let's make sure. Oops. Yes, it is. Okay, so we're just going to um, trace all four of those points and see what kind of a shape we get. Oh, it looks like a circle, actually. Okay, so the answer to this question, surprisingly, not a cycloid, but actually it's just a circle. So how about we take this point and move it up here? And we'll erase all those other traces. Now what kind of a shape are we going to get when we trace these points? Um, let's start up there and animate. All right, definitely not a circle but it's actually an oval. It's called an ellipse, and we'll study them later on this semester. So that's kind of cool. And um, 
the reason that I brought this guy in to this lesson, so let's uh, let's hide. Okay, if I want to hide the point on the ladder, that's fine. And let's hide these other guys as well. Get rid of the traces. So the next thing that I want to do, and the reason that I brought this in today, is that I want to trace out the actual ladders. Not a point on the ladder, but I just want to trace the ladder itself. So I draw that ladder there, I draw another ladder there, I draw that ladder there. And we're going to take a look at the shape that we get. I actually need to make sure I turn the traces on for these guys. Okay, so we get this kind of a crazy looking four-sided. It's not a square, but it's like a, a curvy square. Okay, so what's going on there? What does that have to do with anything? Well, I can relate that to what we did earlier um, by showing you one last sketchpad thing. And I think this is also available on Moodle. So again, we're going to trace uh, this point as this small circle rolls around the inner circle. And so we can, uh, let me actually put the trace on so we can see it. And we get one of those, it's not a cycloid, but this one is an epicycloid because it's inside of a circle instead of being on a straight line. In this case, the ratio of the small circumference to the big circumference is three to one. And so we get a three-sided thing here. So what if I change that ratio? I want to make it something like four to one. All right, that's close enough. So it's at 3.98 at the moment. And now what we're going to do, uh, so we're not going to get a triangular shaped thing anymore. But this particular epicycloid is going to have four points a little bit of funny business here because i didn't quite get four as the ratio it was off by a little bit so that thing right there has a name uh that guy right there is called an asteroid spelled a little bit different than the space rock um, but that is the same exact thing as this so the um i think it's called an envelope but the thing that you get when you trace all these ladders as they fall out is an asteroid which is just a four-pointed epicycloid. So somehow these things are all connected to each other. Remember we had these epicycloids when we spun around inside here. Okay, so let's go back to the this one right here. And this will be the last thing that we're going to do as we play around today. Um, I am going to make the circle bigger. And I want the ratio not to be uh, 3 to 1 like it was in the beginning or 4 to 1 like it was right there, but I want it to be 2 to 1. So here's the question. If you trace this point C as the wheel rolls around the bigger circle, what kind of a curve are we going to get? So when the ratio was 3 to 1 initially, we got like a three-pointed thing. So it was like a triangle but curvy sides. When it was 4 to 1, it was like a square with curvy sides, four points. Now it's 2 to 1. What's it going to look like? All right, so again, we're watching this point C prime right here as we roll the circle inside of the other circle. So what kind of a path does C prime trace out? Traces out a straight line. Again, there's a little bit of funny business here because I didn't quite hit two exactly, but it's a perfectly straight line if you're at a two to one ratio, which is just so strange to me because you've got something round spinning around inside of something else that's round, and yet we're able to make this perfectly straight line. All right, so uh, feel free to play around with these sketchpad things uh, that are on Moodle. And again, um, give the activity a good shot before you look for the video.